Hi, I'm Keith Billis, and this is Live in the Lab. All right. A little bit of weirdness in front of the camera there for anybody who's watching. So I'm like, hey, where's the button? Where's the button? I can't get it going. How did you go viral on TikTok? You were on America's Got Talent. How much do you get paid to be on AGT? Oh, you didn't get paid. Keith and Steve here in Live in the Lab. You're a great interviewer. I love it. 48 miles, 48 hours. And not just once. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I hit 50 last time, and I'm like, yeah, things are a little different than they were 10 years ago. So trust me, things are to keep. You have no time for the BS that much yeah. of society seems to put on the table. Why is that? Like, what you're talking about is real right now. There's just no bullshit here, but it's just real. We brought you in with some Marley. I said, Joseph, let's talk music for a second. You said, well, Keith, oldies, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I've never talked to a sir before. Why are you a sir? In many ways, we're the same story. I came from nothing. <laughs> You came from Earth. I think the old saying goes that if you want a trophy, you climb Everest. If you want respect, you climb K2. I've built my own myself, and it's pretty fascinating when you can have a conversation with yourself with your own knowledge. Have you done that before? Why are we rushing to make these tools if they're all they're going to do is hurt humanity? Does the world need an Oppenheimer moment with AI? What a fun show. Boom! What's going on, nation? Hey, I'm Jack today. Quick 12 second hook to get you hooked in the show. We got a guest today. Today is all about podcasts. We got the CEO of a big podcast network, Michael De Aloya. I think I said his name right. Yeah, we got a little surprise coming up for you in a few minutes. So Michael's going to join us here today. So don't go anywhere. If you're starting a podcast, or if you're starting a show, because we don't do podcasts here. Ah, so Mike, Michael doesn't know the secret yet. I haven't told him the secret yet. He has no idea about the secret yet. Oh, what's the secret you're wondering? <laughs> What camera should I tell you the secret on? How about this one? Here's the secret. Hey, Michael, I got a secret for you, man. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. <sighs> Big pause. Podcasts are staged. Oh my, what? Yeah. Yeah, they're recorded. They're all edited. They're all AI'd. They're all like, they're massaged and they're all made like perfect so that we don't pick up on the air and we don't make <clears throat> mistakes. Nah, we like mistakes. We like raw. Yeah, so we, we like the energy here in the lab. We bring it live, Michael DeAloya. We bring it live Monday to Monday, seven days a week, noon central time. Why? That's how the broadcasting industry started, right? You picked a time, you picked a time slot, you built a brand, you built some energy, you brought people to the table every single day at six o'clock for the news. You brought people every single day at 1135 for David Letterman. They didn't do any, rec well, I guess they recorded it, didn't they? They recorded it to tape. Yeah, just like we are today. Because you can get this on demand. You can get it on demand at inside.bapple.ai. What's that, Keith? Inside. You know how you go, I-N-S-I-D-E. Yeah, inside.bapple.bapl.ai. Inside.bapple.ai. You can get stuff on demand from us. Get some opinions, get some guest content, get tips. Oh, tips. I got a tip for you guys. I got a tip. I did something yesterday. So anyways... I'll get to the tip in a second. Stick around for the show. Great conversation about podcast building, a podcast building, a business, doing live shows, none of that recorded stuff. All jokes aside, Michael, we're going to talk all about podcasts, recording podcasts, doing them live, on demand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But before we get to Michael, I got to give you guys a tip. I'm going to turn the music down. So here's my tip. You know that iPhone you're carrying? It's carrying the future in your pocket. Especially if you have an iPhone 15, and I'm going to show you guys something right now. Let me just do this here. Check this out. <laughs> oh, that feeling he has right now on his own, the freedom. 16, doing his own thing. Man, do I have mixed feelings about the whole thing. See you, pal. <laughs> How's it feel? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to be crying right now, but I am. 
babies. There he goes. So what's that you're asking? That's the future. Yeah. My 16-year-old boy driving away for the first time in my Jeep. Why is it relevant, you're wondering? Because I shot it on this device. But why is it even more relevant, you're wondering? Because tomorrow, metaphorically, when I buy my Apple Vision Pro or I put my MetaQuest headset on my head, it's going to show up in spatial video. It's going to bring me back to the moment, to relive the moment. So I captured the content today to relive it in a special place tomorrow. So there's a tip. If you got that phone, turn it on. Turn that switch, iPhone 15, turn on spatial video, start capturing content, capturing those memories today so you can relive them in a wonderful, immersive state tomorrow. So there's your tip today. I'm going to get out of here and bring in Michael DeAloya. He's sitting over there in the green room. We know how it all works, guys. We bring the guests in. They sit in the green room. They wait patiently for Uncle Keith to bring him in. And now, now, I know he's patiently waiting. We're going to bring it in here. We're going to do that. We're going to do this over here. We're going to bring Michael to the stage. We're going to do that, do this. And there he is, Michael DeAloya from Evergreen Podcast. Keith, how are you living, man? I am living exceptionally well. Check this out. Oh, we're twins. Dude. We're rocking, man. But here's the thing. Brother I have from another contact, mother, man. Brother from another. I got my contact lenses on underneath my glasses, so I'm actually not seeing nothing right now. <laughs> well, you look good. You look good. Solid. I wanted to match the energy. Hey, I, I'm really grateful you're here today. As I told you before we stepped into the room, really excited. Going to be very selfish about today's show because I just want to learn and I want my audience to learn, learn, learn about your business, about you, about the podcast industry. I just want you to just fill us up, Michael, fill us up with knowledge. But before we do that, let's get the audience caring about you. I typically don't tell my audience much about the guests. I'll let the guests kind of introduce themselves. Right so I'll, t- I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell the audience this. Audience, don't hold this against Michael, but he's from Cleveland. The 216 rocks, Keith. Come on, man. <laughs> hey, the home of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, brother. It, it is. It is for sure. We're, we're a great city by a great lake. That's yes. how I put it out to people. So what brought you to Cleveland? You born, raised, and bred there? No, I was... Born and raised in the city a bit south of here, Dayton, Ohio, you know, a, a manufacturing industrial city, much like yeah. Cleveland. I somehow got into Case Western Reserve University for grad school, MBA. And that's what brought me up to Cleveland. Okay. But the personality of the city, it matches my own, just a scrappy underdog. Love it. Uh, industrious type of a place. I was smitten uh, as soon as I was driving up. 77 through the uh, steel mills yeah having fire coming out the factory uh furnaces it was pretty wild scene (laughs) a bit dystopian but i just loved it and i've everything great in my life both personally and professionally i've been able to do in cleveland and i've done quite a bit um it really is a city with no boundaries if you if you're really committed to growing yourself no other place but but here so It's funny because I had written that quote down. Everything great in Michael's life has happened in Cleveland, both professionally and personally. Yeah, Michael, why is Cleveland always teased? So I'm from Canada, so I'm not an American yet. Yet from the outside in, it it, it seems like places like Cleveland or Baltimore, both those places seem to be like the the teasing spots of, of, of the eastern seaboard. Why is that? I think because of... Today, I, I would say that was historically true until recently. I think okay. Okay. the reputation of both cities have gotten better. I mean, Baltimore with The Wire, yeah. Cleveland with LeBron James. I mean, it, both cities have gone through a, a revelation and a revolution, and Cleveland in particular. I mean, if you saw downtown Cleveland 10, 15 years ago, it would have been a ghost town. Yeah. Now it's it's a really lively place. There's entertainment everywhere. The sports teams, the uh, the symphony, the arts. I mean, it's just really a crazy place. But the underlying thing I think that works here is that there's an entrepreneurial a revolution going on in Cleveland where 
you know, we're creating a global podcast network, almost hiding in plain sight in Cleveland, Ohio, truth be told. We ended up buying, and we'll definitely tell you some more history yeah. about Evergreen, but we bought an old radio station here in Cleveland that had been abandoned for 10, 12 years. We bought it during COVID, and that's where I'm sitting now. We're in a building has got five podcast studios. You know, we're getting feeds from all over the world for, you know, we've got over 300 shows. And this is, Cleveland's one of these rare places where you can do that. You can find an old industrial asset, like yeah. industrial radio, right? And turn it into a state-of-the-art cutting-edge facility. We, we, you know, we love changing things and, and really being progressive uh, in our entrepreneurial endeavors. And Cleveland just really allows you to do that. It's that underdog status, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Chip on your shoulder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You gotta have that. I'm in Winnipeg. I'm not sure what and if you know much about Winnipeg, Canada, Michael, but uh, perhaps similar to Cleveland, uh, some might consider the armpit of Canada. We're right in the middle of Canada. Like there's not much going on in Winnipeg, but yet we're the underdog and we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're scrappy and we're hardworking and, 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 it's a lot of who I am and who this brand is, is that we show up every single day. You're not going to find somebody who works harder than a Winnipegger or a Manitoban or probably a Clevelander, right? Like we just show up and we go to work. We roll up our sleeves and yeah. we go to work. And I think it's very similar to probably what happens in Cleveland. No doubt about it. And it's, uh, is it the Blue Bombers in Winnipeg? Yeah, the, you're absolutely right. On the football side of things, it's the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. On the hockey yeah. side of things, it's the Winnipeg Jets. I've, I've watched them both on TV, believe it or not. I get the Canadian <laughs> sports channel feed. Yeah. And um, I, I, am, I love Canadian football. And my wife and I have traveled quite a bit. We've been to Toronto, okay. Vancouver, Whistler, uh, Banff. And you know, I've been dying to get to a uh, CFL game. And we'll, we'll make that happen. And hopefully Winnipeg will be that first time. But I agree with you. There's a grit and a tenacity because we have been made fun of. We've been belittled a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when people show up to Cleveland or to Winnipeg, they are shocked. Yes. About how cool these places are and how relevant they are. And even better, like you're an entrepreneur. You're doing your thing here. We're trying to grow up a podcast network. People let you work. They don't get in your way, ah, right? Mm -hmm. They don't. Throw, they, they, they don't throw boundaries. I've got open field in front of us, and we're just going to run with it. And uh, the support that we've gotten, both financially and and from the community, from the city of Cleveland, which helped us, you know, find this place, uh, helped us get in here, because we were in a suburb, a little west uh, of Cleveland, but we really wanted to get into the into the city. Like I'm looking out. There's a factory right here that they're turning into uh, the police headquarters. Mm. Uh, right next to it are a bunch of new apartments going in. You know, the highway's right here. I, we have our own little highway exit. It's just a nice little gritty corner of promise. You know, yeah, of promise. Yeah, and probably a great place to raise your kids too. I'm thinking, right? Because it's good hard work ethic, under the radar. Just get up, go to work, low key. Correct? Yeah, I have a daughter, yeah. and. Uh, you know, the, you're right. You know, the, the education system solid, but even better, she, there, she can go to dance, you know, and she can, you know, she's learning piano and she's in dance classes, she's mm -hmm. on sports teams. There's like, again, no hurdle that we can't get over, you know, and I'm glad that I could provide and my wife too, that we could provide her with an education I didn't have. I just went to school. That's all I did when I was growing up. Right. Allow her to have these other experiences because I think, and I think you would agree with this. It's like sometimes, you know, education is a key part of life, but it's not the only thing. It's the experiences that you have Absolutely. in life. They really make yeah. you the person that you are. Yes. And I just want to deliver great experiences for, you know, my daughter, for my wife, my family, and for the employees that we have at, at, at Evergreen. Yeah, we we really want intellectually curious, driven people uh, to come into the business. But also, we really promote the fact that we want them to do other things outside. A lot of companies kind of like, you only work here. You only want 
we want musicians, we want poets, we want yes. writers, we want filmmakers. We want that creative class doing really profound things in an environment that they love. Oh man, I uh, where am I going to go with this? Because you just opened up a bunch of cans of worms for me here, uh, and I will tell you that for sure. The so first of all, this idea that uh, education uh, and experiences, and you talk about experiences. We, we're now living in the AI era, Generation AI, right? Knowledge is a commodity, but experiences aren't. Agreed. The more that we can empower our colleagues, our humans around us to have experiences and bring that value to the table, because the knowledge is already there. We don't need to go get knowledge. The knowledge is already there. It's in, it's, it's, and there's only more knowledge coming to us. Yeah. So I love your attitude about encouraging your, your, your audience, encouraging your, your teammates, your colleagues. And I have the same attitude about that. Go live life. Work will happen. Because instead of go work and live life, go live life, work will happen as a result of it, frankly. Right. And, and I love to hear your perspective yep. on that because that's, that's exactly the same way I, I, I look at things. So I, um, when I did my research on Evergreen Podcast before today's show, I said to myself, hmm, I'm hoping this show doesn't cost me any money because <laughs> I see what they're doing and you're, you're essentially taking, let's, let's, let's talk history for a few months. And today's a great time to talk history. So Netflix is actually yesterday's HBO. And TikTok is turning into yesterday's YouTube because we're going to go back to horizontal video. We've gone back to advertisements on Prime Video, advertisements on Netflix. Yeah. And you guys are recreating yesterday's radio network. I love it. Like, And I, with all respect, there's nothing that you are doing is original. But what you're doing is what has been proven successful in the past. And when you told me you bought a building of an old radio station, I'm like, of course you did. <laughs> yeah. They're all legacy assets, right? They're all legacy yeah. concepts just wrapped in a new veneer. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And that's how we explain it, too. I, I have uh, my grandmother, before she passed away, was like, what do you do? What's yeah. a podcast? I'm like, consider it a radio show that you can listen whenever you want. You know, you don't have to be at that radio at that time to hear it. Open your phone click play and it's it's you're ready to go um i grew up i think we're around the same age it, it seems that way we're i'm like, 52 30, next month i'll be 55 yeah, yeah. we're the same age yeah me too march 1st brother really oh wow yeah. march 9th man that's crazy oh, uh awesome. <laughs> so you're pisces too i take i'm you. a pisces too my friend yes <laughs> yeah my daughter's in an aquarius sign so we're okay. both water signs and yes there's not a lot of swimming in Cleveland, like in Winnipeg, you know, during you know, <laughs> your summers are only, you know, 90 days. And, That's uh, exactly right. But we're fish. And so we, we, we belong to a club that has a pool. We're in that pool every day. Nice. Um, and then what's great is you can look out the pool and you've got Rocky, the Rocky River flowing into Lake Erie. So it's just nothing but a plane of water. Really in front cool. of you. It's Very cool. Fantastic. Um but yeah, getting back to the, the the, I think there's a there's some meta discussions going on here where, you know, Winnipeg and Cleveland are these legacy industrial towns. I'm assuming Winnipeg's more of a mining and railroad, forestry and things of that nature. Maybe some farming, but legacy nonetheless. Yes. But I think dressing them up in new economy um, business models or concepts. Yes. They play better here because one, it's cheaper to do it. Right. We, we, I don't have to be in New York or LA or Chicago to have global influence mm -hmm. and neither do you, because we're connected to the internet where everything is compressed mm -hmm. in terms of time and availability. So I just want to, you know, have this wild ride for the next five to seven years before we sell or exit. And you know, build this thing as big as I can That's at a exactly. cost benefit that it, it, you couldn't match in LA, New York, you know, or the larger cities. We're at a very distinct advantage. Not to mention this radio station sits on one of the largest fiber pipes in the United States. So I have all the connectivity I, I could ever ever desire. 
So let's just openly talk business plans on the air in front of everybody. So I'm telling you, man, like I, I'm looking around my neighborhood here and I might say neighborhood Canada and I'm seeing like, so two years ago, three years ago, just post pandemic TSN, our ESPN here in Canada, TSN went and shut down all their sports stations across the country. And then as a result, all the guys that were hosting the sports stations all went back and started their own podcasts. So now you have Winnipeg Sports Talk, you have Edmonton Sports Talk, Regina Sports Talk, ran by the same guys that were running the legacy shows back on the radio station. That's right. So yeah. I'm sitting here going, okay, when should I open my wallet up and go buy all of them and create a network again? Because that's exactly what's going to happen, isn't it, Michael? Like, let's just be frank here. Like, somebody's going to wake up going to one day and say, okay, let's go buy Winnipeg, Regina, Edmonton, Saskatoon, and we'll go start TSN2. I'm using metaphors here. The yeah, future of version of it based on what happened yesterday without all the overhead. And oh, now there's AI here, we can even have less overhead. But that really is the future, isn't it? I'm telling somebody the business plan right now. Am I correct? That's the business plan that we're implementing as you yes. and I are talking. So we, we're out buying assets, both legacy and, and new economy. So we are buying a number of podcast shows, podcast networks. Hosts, you looking for a good host? I know a guy. <laughs> Oh, hey. You're a target. You're an absolute target. <laughs> but the idea is for, for, for us, you know, to build a network, you need scale. I mean, yes. Right. And so last year we did 30 million downloads. I think this year we'll, if nothing else changed, we'll do between 48 and 50 million downloads. I think we'll do more than that. But if nothing else happened, we're at that 48 to $50 million dollar or 50 million download mark. We need tremendous scale and, and to, to really deliver a value to maybe a suitor for us. Again, we're out buying smaller networks and, and, and larger shows to aggregate everything, improve our intellectual property portfolio, what have you, raise our terminal value in the, the valuation of the company. So, it's happening now. And, and what's really fascinating is the media landscape, as you know, it's just like completely discombobulated. It's almost chaos. It's collapsing well, in front of us right now, isn't it? it? It's absolutely it's collapsing. Absolutely crazy. Yes. But out of that are new companies that are going to rise. Oh, up. Yes, I know. That, that's what I'm excited about because you're seeing these new companies rise from the ashes. And I want us to be one of those. Yes. Companies that are coming out like the Phoenix out of the ashes. Luckily, we've got a very strong financial partner that's given us the flexibility to do these things. And, you know, last year we acquired three networks. This year we we've already acquired one called bright Chilla out of Australia. And we're looking at a family based faith based channel out of, uh, out of Austin that will bring tremendous amount of downloads and value Smart. to us. So we, we're just, being opportunistic, but the plan has always been grow as fast as you can. Yes. Deliver the downloads and the uh, ears for a larger conglomerate to acquire. And I think our horizon of five to seven years out is pretty appropriate. Pausing because I got a bunch of questions. Apple made some changes technically to how they yeah. deliver podcasts and how they deliver downloads you mentioned your metrics on measuring downloads and how you've used that same metric probably for the last forever they yeah. made a significant change which i suspect is going to affect your metric has it it has the fourth quarter you saw between 18 and 20 percent drop really in our show catalogs especially shows with a longer term who've been around longer and there's a reason for that so a lot of our legacy shows experienced a lot of downloads in their back catalog. So uh, as they gained a you know a new subscriber, yeah, that would download the catalog and you get you, you, you would get a bump. And we always preach there's two solid there's a lot of metrics to be successful, but the two biggest ones in podcasting are cadence. If, like you do this every day, seven days a week, Monday to yeah. Monday. Yeah. Thank you. That, that cadence. <laughs> Live that cadence on, on YouTube X and LinkedIn. Courtesy of Michael DeHoya. <laughs> if you're doing a show that's every other week, you got to keep it every other week. If it's a daily, you got to keep it daily. 
Yeah. Right? If it's yeah. monthly, that cadence is important. Yeah. And the second thing is, is legacy is like the longer you're doing this, the better chance of success that you have. And while there are shows that have tremendous success early on, they're very rare. Mm -hmm. They are rare. For example, during COVID, it's like from 20 to 22, the top 20, 25 podcasts didn't change. They may have flipped spots. It was nearly impossible to get a top 25 new podcast. You, the shows just couldn't break in. But over a long period of time, those shows could be could prove to be very successful. So that's what we always pitch when we're talking to someone about a show is what's your cadence and how long do you want to do this? Because it's not going to be a short term fix, because if it's a short term mindset, we're probably not the network for you. And you're probably not going to see the success that you could have had you lasted longer. So when Apple made this change, it affected that legacy part quite a bit. Mm. That back catalog isn't being downloaded. And when you're selling run a network, you're typically or a ch you know, run of channel. You're, you're, you're offering that that back catalog as a big component to, to downloads and listens. Right. So it did have an effect. It, it it's going to compress it won't compress cpm rates but it, it would compress the aggregate dollar that you're getting the gross dollar that you're getting out of run a network and channel runs for those advertising spots yeah so but yeah we were down 18 to 20 percent and quite frankly if we hadn't acquired a, a, those three networks that i mentioned earlier we would have been smaller than we were <laughs> Yeah. six months prior yeah yeah Download growth but we're delivering right now between 2.4 and 2.6 million downloads a month okay from evergreen out behind the scenes what i think really differentiates us a little bit more than most podcast networks is we're the sales agent for right now about 10 other networks okay uh, so nippon broadcasting system out of japan we rep them in north america Crowd Network out of the UK. We rep them in North America. Broadway Podcast Network, Independent Podcast Network, Truck and Hustle. So we're aggregating behind the scenes. Smart. Networks that aren't, that Smart. we aren't, we're not distributing. Yes. So now we can distribute 18 to 20 million downloads a month, right? And sell American brands into foreign markets that are valuable to them. Well, and, and as important, you can get familiar with their business along the way, nudge, sure. nudge, wink, wink. And if the time comes where it makes sense to get closer to the business, if you know what I mean, you already have history on it. An important history. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up, Keith, because the first five or six years of our company, our brand was built on industry awareness, yeah. not for the end consumer. Because to be frank, if you were to pick up one of our podcasts, you probably wouldn't care or realize that it was an evergreen show right. yeah but for the industry we wanted the industry to know who evergreen was this emerging growth um podcast or audio media company mm -hmm. it's only been in the last 18 months 24 months that we've gotten we're, we're pivoting the brand strategy from industry to advertisers and brands ah uh, mm -hmm. and that's going to take us another five seven years to really you know benefit from the significant dollars that we're investing in that so we you know we're using hubspot with different sales databases sitting on top pushing out outbound inbound campaigns to drive traffic from the brand we're, we're, literally, we're literally targeting brands direct um which is a little bit unusual for podcast networks who typically outsource their sales to a third party um and they're you know they're getting a lower net cpm rate we don't want to do that we want full cpm rates as much as we can and i want to sell sponsorships which are higher margin than your typical cpm you're a perfect candidate for sponsorships right you know groups that would write you a check coca-cola pepsi right. right a good canadian whiskey you know what i mean yes 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 that would, that would write you a check for 10 15 25 thousand Canadian or US dollars 
I think we're still trading at a discount to the yes. Canadian currency. Yes, you are. 100%. So you, you want them in Canadian dollars, right? Uh, yeah, so. yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, actually. I want it in U.S. funds. You do? Man. You want U.S. dollars? Oh, I want it in U.S. dollars. Of course I do. <laughs> you know, you said something, though, and I was going to – I needed an opening to disagree with you. You're like, we're doing something that, you know, most people, you know, most brand, podcast networks wouldn't traditionally do, which is go and, go and attack brands. No, Michael, you're from Cleveland. That's what you do. You roll your sleeves up, you go to work, you knock on doors that others wouldn't do because people in New York and Chicago, they're just letting other people do it. But because you're in Cleveland, you're like, no, nah, we're going to go do it ourselves. Well, in the early days, we were, we were ignored because yeah, you know, yeah. we were in the major media markets. We're from, where are you from? Cleveland. Uh, you can just yeah. see it a little bit. Hang up the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, over a period of time, you know, we've, I think, demonstrated um, our growth capabilities and the promise of our shows. And we deliver. That's why advertisers and sponsors keep on coming back is because we just keep delivering the audience that they want. So it's real important to us. And um, we just want to slather the brands in love. But most brands aren't aware of us. And as you know, with the media industry in, in, in meltdown, I think there's great debate on the advertising and sponsorship level, where do we put these, these dollars, you know, linear TV really had a nice little kick. It didn't decrease as much as people thought last year, because advertising, where are we going to put the cash? We're, you know, we'll park it in assets that are legacy because they work. So legacy TV, now that Netflix and Hulu and others are going to be allowing advertisements on their streaming platforms, right? Netflix is a business case study in, it's a wonderful case study happening in front of us right now. They're growing and they're growing faster because of advertising than they were before. Because, and they, they have figured it out. And, and like I said, Netflix is just yesterday's linear TV delivered on the internet instead of delivered on old Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when you used to get the CDs in the mail from uh, Netflix. Yes. What's crazy is like, you know, Blockbuster could have bought them at one point in time. Yes. And didn't. And uh, we all know how that played out. Netflix, I think Netflix, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, these are four behemoths that all have media opportunities attached to them or all tremendous case studies of how to, you know, manage a consumer through a whole spectrum of experiences like we were talking about before apple in particular the phone is the you know entry point to their whole ecosystem e eco that's right yeah. their whole entire ecosystem of music podcasts movies apps additional experiences i was on apple plus a few days ago and quite frankly you know i've got most of the streaming service that we cut cable only to buy every effing uh you know streaming service out there but i was on apple it's not the best but then i clicked onto their apple music um channel and it was like reliving my mtv days that's true and, and it was profound it just really caught me like i'm sitting there like thinking i'm really enjoying this because you don't get to see music videos yes mtv is all reality shows anymore yes. right yes but here we are watching videos and even there, I'm thinking, like, how can Apple capture more people? As I'm watching this video, there should be a QR code in the corner, which I can photograph. It downloads the song and the video right away, right? If I'm not in Apple Music, I get charged for that. If I'm in Apple Music, it just downloads automatically. There's a lot of ways that Apple can then close the circle even further with the assets that they have. I... Um... How has, let me reach, let me rechange my questioning here. You have been around long enough to notice the preponderance of video taking over the podcast space, where now it's not just enough to have a microphone, you need to have a microphone and a camera. How yeah. has that affected the space? How has it affected people's barrier to entry? I have to assume it's only affected the space monetarily wise because you're making more money with ads. But talk about how podcasting has much now become broadcasting as much as it's audio casting. Yeah, the, 
I, my my joke on podcasting was like, you know, the best thing about podcasting it's a democratized technology. The worst thing about podcasting it's a democratized yeah. technology. Yeah, and you know, video is only strengthening that that democratization. I think if you're starting a podcast today, as opposed to even two or three years ago, it has to be born in the duality of audio and video. It, it just has to. Yeah, you have to have your YouTube channel, pushing the content. Now, mind you, it could be just the audio stream, right? It, it, yeah. With some sort of placard or or graphic that's kind of just static in the in the background. People are coming to YouTube, turning it on, and it's in the background, where historically it's been a more lean-in type technology. But you have to have it. And, and I think it's going to be pushing out additional content into – your Facebook lives, your TikTok lives, right? Your, your yes, your X or Twitter. I'm still a traditionalist. I, I still call it Twitter, but yes, you know, you'll have the benefit of reaching audiences. Even if you, Hey, I got a 30 second thought you turn on all the, the channels live and you just go for it. Why not? I mean, it, it's a great thing to do throughout the day, but you, you, you're right. You're going to have to have that catalog. YouTube is the second largest podcast search engine. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the dominant one. Um, video is really mission critical to us. We've behind the scenes, we launched a video on demand channel called Evergreen Now. We, we probably, well, we didn't probably, we picked the wrong technology partner. So we're reevaluating ah. who, who the next partner, and we're going to relaunch this video side. And so we're offering now to all of our partners. <clears throat> If you know, send us your video feed. We'll put it up on. We'll we'll manage your YouTube for you, and obviously we we take a commission off of that. But we'll manage all that for you. We've got AI tools that help design the video, design the podcast, put them where they're supposed to go. Uh, and then we also have the, you know, we'll have this video on demand channel where all of this stuff will reside mm -hmm. in a big catalog where you can go in and pick. The top podcasts that you know, that are available in Evergreen, just as a, it's really a complimentary service that we want to offer, so everyone on the audio network can then go video mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and got a distribution point for it. So it, it is a major thing. We've, um, I know we're still focusing on downloads and audio, and that that's probably going to maintain true. But I, I would guarantee in five to seven years that arc is going to switch where, you know, video is just the primary tool and, the, you know, your audio is a close second. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you're mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's a trend that we monitor all the time. We try to learn as much as we can on YouTube. We have a few shows making some serious dollars on YouTube, and we think we can replicate that throughout the portfolio. So. If you're starting a podcast today, I read something on LinkedIn recently. Uh, it was along the lines of, you know, starting a podcast in 2024, difficult, difficult space to break into because everybody, you said, democratize. So either A, you have to have an interesting format. B, you have to have a, a, an interesting talent, like a host that, that stands out perhaps above the rest. And then C, just try to show up more than everybody else. How do you break out in 2024 starting a podcast, Michael? I would say this. It probably has to be long tail niche, right? So mm -hmm. I can point to examples of great success that we've had mm -hmm. of niche audiences. So Banking Transformed is it's run by top 10 influencer in fin you know, fintech, financial technology. And you know, that show is probably hitting mid six figures on an annualized basis in terms of revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's doing between, let's say, 18 to 25,000 downloads a month. It's not a large show, mm -hmm. but because it's 18 to 25,000 influencers, executives, participants in the fintech community, it has a lot of influence and pool. Very similarly, a, a show that we rep and is on the network is called Truck and Hustle. Mm -hmm. So it's in the shipping, logistics, um, and delivery marketplace. Mm -hmm. They're doing a little bit more, let's say like sixty to 70,000 downloads a month. And they also have a corresponding 
event program behind the show. So while you're listening to the show, you'll hear, you know, commercials or promotions on, hey, we've got a regional event here. Please come attend or come to our annual event. They're really trying to create a community around the Truck and Hustle brand. Mm -hmm. And I, I dare say they'll probably hit seven figures this year in mm -hmm. terms of revenue. So if I were to say one thing is like go long tail, go niche, preferably with some sort of business expertise, but it could also be media. Like if you went like super deep into, you know, this may be a bad example given the, the times, but like, you know, just a super nerdy niche Star Wars show, you might yeah. probably get a little bit more trajectory than doing a movie show. Right. You know what I mean, like yes. if you're going to do movies or entertainment, be niche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you get yourself found by doing it over and over and over and over and just creating good quality content would you say that's the other like tip what makes you know star athletes great is that the fact that they just people think they had natural ability which they do they got god-given talent there's no question yes. but they practice and they practice and they practice they're singularly focused on their craft yes, yes. it's uh, it, there's no difference than a, a great woodmaker and a, an nba talent outside of one makes more than the other mm -hmm. but it's repetition Mm -hmm. practice so cadence and longevity you, you got to have it because if you're gonna you got the tools you could pop out a podcast super quick right and but if if you're not consistent with it or committed to it it's going to go nowhere just like everything else yes so yeah. we, we, we preach that a lot we we try to vet well and we've got 300 shows in the catalog well the shows die there's you know what i mean uh, and we fight the battle, too, of even with the the recent golden age of television where you had all these shows in production, mm -hmm. there are only 580 TV shows in production, which is a lot. I had to deal with three million podcasts being produced, you know, at some point in time throughout 2023. That's a hard that's a harder battle. It's a harder battle. So you have to be. You know, in the early days of Evergreen, it was like if you had a pulse in a podcast, you probably made it onto the network. But today, if you're not niche or delivering a hundred thousand downloads a month, because we need scale, yes, we need market opportunity. You probably just you're probably not going to make it. Yeah, I cracked during my opening monologue about the fact that I do this live. And I crack jokes about podcasts being recorded. And I, I was, I, I used some branding very similar to how, when, I don't know if you recall when Salesforce first came out a number of years ago, uh, Michael, they launched that, uh, it was a logo, which was software with a strike through it. Basically telling you as a consumer, this is not software. So my, I, I've created a logo, which is a podcast logo with a strike through it. And I'm selling myself as this is a, sh I'm a SaaS company. We're a show as a service. So we show up every single day, you know, in <laughs> That moniker that is that's fantastic yeah because yeah. I, I don't want my people to be passive i want somebody to get something out when you listen to this show when you listen to my so let me let me just again let me so let me share with you some of the things that i've been doing here to get your feedback on right so yeah, when i started this thing somebody said to me keith you got to do a podcast i'm like oh, fuck, i don't want to do a podcast because everybody's podcast and everybody's a podcast they start with one day then they don't do it ever again or they do it in somebody's basement and there's 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 this and I'm sorry, with all respect, there's kind of like this perception yeah. of podcasts that they're just done in a closet sometimes. And they're just kind of, they, they start and they end and there's, they're, they're not professional. The professional ones are professional and you know that they are, but sure. there's kind of a brush that's painted across all of them. So the, the person saying to me, okay, you got to do podcasts. I'm like, no, nah, fuck it. I'm doing a show. He's like, what? I'm going to do a show live Monday to Friday at noon central time. I hadn't even given it any thought. I just said, we're doing Monday to Friday, noon central time. Why? I said, I'm alive at noon central time every single day of the week. I, there's no reason I can't sit down here, noon central time, Monday to Friday, and stream on live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and X. Because if I'm going to record anyways, why not do it live? And what a wonderful way to hold myself accountable to a time Instead of just writing it down, going on the air and telling the world I'm showing up every single day at noon. All right, I'm showing up every single day at noon. Now I'm, now I'm committed to that. But then what I also did, Michael, was I wanted to steal a page out of yesterday's history. 11.35 was Letterman, 6 o'clock news. You know, just those how, how we were raised as human beings, raised on the time slot. Sure. Yeah. I know it's not as relevant today 
to, to humans, but I still think in some regards it is. And I think people like the idea of live. Would love to hear your point of view on what I'm trying to do and what you're thinking of live and just this whole show as a service, all of these things I've thrown at you. Love to hear. And don't just sugarcoat if you if you're thinking, Keith, I don't agree with you. I want to hear it. Tell me what you think. No, look, there's something to this model because you've got Adam Carolla, you've got Von Miller, you know, who are out there doing this, right? So I think keeping I think keeping a, your devotion to it at that slot is important, but you're also building pretty quickly a back catalog that you can point to and show to people. Like when I was watching you, wow. when I was in the, when I was getting my makeup done in the, uh, <laughs> in your uh, back office there. Uh, in the green room, yes. Yeah, in the green room. <laughs> uh, and, and we actually do have a green room here, so it worked out beautifully. Uh, you're playing all those clips with all those different yes. guests. And I, it just struck me like, well, the dude's getting the interviews. Mike, you're getting great interviews. Thank you. You're asking poignant questions, and the discipline is there. Like, you're a showrunner. You're yes. not just a host. You're a showrunner. There's a big difference between the two. Oh, they do everything, man. Like, there's just me, myself, and I. Yeah. <laughs> and... But, and no, I listen. You're using the right tools, right? You're using Streamyard. We use uh, Riverside.fm. Yep. Uh, Streamyard's got a little bit more of these functional tools and you yep. know, the banners and what have you. But you're building a brand. You're the showrunner. You're consistent. You got cadence, and you're. I, truth be told, you're a great interviewer. And I'll tell you, what makes Rogan Rogan. And even, you know, I, I have my disagreements with Rome, Rogan. I also think he has moments of great inspiration. Um, when you think of, you know, others that came before him, like Stern. Right? Yes, yes. That's who I grew up with. Yeah, for sure. It, like, there are moments where I'm like, I just like, can Stern be more crass? But there's also moments of Stern just hit it out of the ballpark. Those Both those guys have captured a zeitgeist of, of being great interviews. Errors. Yeah, they, they offer great interviews and they're great interviewers. And that's where I see where you are aspiring to be. Yes, thank you. A captivating interviewer, right? Yes. It, you, it's entertaining. It's yes. educational. It's informative. Yes. That's not right. That, that formula works. And I don't know why more people don't do that formula. I, so we're gonna. I'm glad we're recording this because you just said my spin. I like to entertain and inform. I let others inform and bore. I entertain and inform. Others can inform and bore. So you come to our show to be entertained, get some information, have some fun, have good, inspiring conversation. Right I'll, I'll tell you, Michael, where I had a, I had one of those uh, epiphanies in my own head a number of weeks ago when I was trying to do too much one day. I thank you for saying showrunner because yeah, I was trying to do too much one day, and I finally said to myself, "What the fuck, man? I'm not a, I'm not a short form content guy. I'm not a. I need to go get my 30 second clip on TikTok. No." I want to have a wonderful in-depth conversation with Michael De Aloya, and I want to learn about the moment behind the moment and then more about the moment behind it. That's what I like. I had a guy on my show a couple weeks ago who he's introducing himself and he lets it, he lets it sneak out that he used to sell F-18 fighter jets. Well, uncle Keith goes, huh? You say F-18 fighter jets? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I was, selling, I was 24 years old, traveling around the world, selling. I'm like, holy fuck, man. All right, we're going to overtime. We're going to talk about that for half an hour because I know my audience likes that. Then the next day, I got a guy on my show. He's like, yeah, I worked for DARPA. I'm like, excuse me? You worked for DARPA, the biggest agency in the U.S. with the biggest budget to, to actually invent technology for the United States? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, let's talk about this for an hour. And we didn't talk nothing about what he came on the show for because that is stuff that I think people want to hear about. Because it's interesting to me, and I believe yeah. if it's interesting to me, it's going to be interesting to you, Michael. Yeah. I believe listen, that. Listen, Stern and Rogan they didn't come into the show daily with preconceived notions. You know what I mean? Like I never let, have a script ever. Yeah, they let the interview f unfold. Yes. So that is Lex I, Friedman's I, awesome today. Lex Friedman, you know, Lex, he's fantastic. MIT guy. Love Lex. Lex every month. I mean, he's one of our advisors 
and uh, I'm glad you brought him up. That that's a it's a sweetheart of a dude. And I aspire to be Lex, but I'm not Lex. But his stuff, man, incredible. Yeah, he's 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 solid. He's, he's and just generally a good guy. Yeah, I was uh, I was watching a Rick Rubin clip. Yeah. Oh, I love Rick Rubin. Ran into him in Miami. <laughs> and now that's a guy I would love to hang out with. And oh. he was talking about. The Abbott Brothers, who are one of my favorite bands, you know, folk rock, yeah, um, country rock, and he, he was just coming. Like, if someone asked him who are, who who are some of the best acts you worked with, and I, I'm assuming the interview was thinking he was going to say, oh, Paul McCartney, or yeah, so, so, and, yeah, you know, uh, and he's like the Abbott Brothers, and the guy was stunned, like the Abbott Brothers. And he's like, yeah, I'll tell you why, because they're the nicest fucking people on planet Earth. You you want you root for people like that. Yes. You want to know people like that. Yes. Right? Yes. And, that's, and I just thought that wow, that's a really central point because you're trying to make. And I'm I'm assuming you you've interviewed you've scheduled some interviews of people who are talking about challenging topics, you know, that may border on not interesting you know what i mean like yeah 100 i get them yeah. in my, i get them in the lab trust me yeah <laughs> but some the great interviewer is always going to make them the most fascinating person for that half hour or hour and yes. stern does that great because stern listen stern he's stern but the interviews are what makes stern man he just gets people to talk about things that just blow your mind they're so insightful and interesting and and you know why? Because he's intellectually curious, just like you. Yes. You you, you hit so like DARPA when you get mentioning it with DARPA. There's something that rung your bell. I was like, that is fascinating. Why aren't we talking about that more? And he he was probably talking about. Well, we went and talked about Stuxnet, and we talked about the. And he, he's like, Can you, you're gonna talk about Stuxnet. I go, yeah. He goes, who the hell are you? I go, believe me, I like to read. He goes, yes, you must like to read because nobody's ever asked me about Stuxnet before. And I'm like, yeah, we're gonna talk Stuxnet today. And my wife and people looking at me like, Billis, how do you know this shit? And I'm like, I just like to read. I'm well read. I'm I'm a curious mofo. Yeah, I was. I I am reading like Apple News. Yes. Constantly throughout the day, it's my death scroll. I, I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. I'm on apple news and i'm sharing like with the executive team we share articles all the time yeah and one of the the new newsletters that i'm really enjoy like puck which is they do a lot of a lot of vanity fair long form articles yes, yes. daily when i'm i'm a sucker for the old vanity fair and <laughs> me too i love those uh those old stories on the royals and all this juicy details it's the same with puck but it's about business yes and technology and media things that we're interested in because we're in that industry and business and we're almost ir an irrelevant fixture in the media landscape because just it's so large and we're this up and coming you know thing that's growing and not a lot of people have noticed this yet but that's on us to make it happen nonetheless i think what you're you're getting back to our discussion here was like you asked me my critique and insight as to what you're producing. Yeah. And it's it's always the interviewer that, that, that makes the shows great. And you're letting people talk in long form. Right. And you're listening. That's a how many people I, I watch all those late night shows and I listen. There's some good ones out there, but there's also people who don't listen. It's all about them. You know what I mean? I always say it can't be about you. You know what I mean, Keith? It's got to be. So thank you for that. And I appreciate you noticing that. A couple of things I'll throw back at you. When I named the show, I purposely named it Live in the Lab with Keith Billis because of branding. It wasn't Live in the Lab with just Live in the Lab and anybody can sit here. Yes, you know, Michael can be a guest one day. It was, it's like the late show with David Letterman. It wasn't just the late show. And That's sometimes right. he's a guest host, right? So yep. it's, it's Live in the Lab with Keith Billis. The second thing I tell people is if you want to learn how to become a great listener, go start a podcast. Because a couple weeks into this, my uh, a guy I was working with who's helping me with producing, uh, he interrupted me in one of my shows. That Keith, stop fucking talking, man! Because you, we can't do post show edits if you're always going to talk over the guest, and we can't and we can't create good post show content for social feeds if you're always going to interrupt the guest. I was like, right. So I learned 
how to become a much better listener, give my guests much more runway to speak, while at the same time, I think it's clear to the guests and my listeners, this is still my show. It's still a Howard Stern show. It's still the Joe Rogan show. This is the Keith Billis show. It's my show. It's my point of view. Um, you know, I have my opinions. I don't sell it to advertisers. But at the same time, my goal here is to bring the best out in you as my guest so I can entertain my audience. You follow me? And that's the magic is bringing yes. out the best of the other person, right? Not, I think everybody has a great story. Them, you know about. what I'm saying? You're not defeating them. Yes. You're bringing out the best. And there's so many shows where they're trying to, like, knock the interviewer down. You see it all. Yes, yeah, CNN, MSNBC, Fox. I mean, they're all. And I'm sure there's a corresponding, you know, Canadian equivalent. But it, it's interesting to hear you say it because I had some feedback from listeners say to me, Keith, I love that you're a fanboy of your guests. Because when you fanboy over your guests, you get me as the listener fanboying over the guest as well. And he's like, I, and this, this, I had a couple people come to me and say, when I watch late night talk shows and I see like Jimmy Fallon really fanboying over his guests or, and getting into it and singing the music and just becoming their biggest like ch champion, he goes, I get behind that person as well. And he's like, and Keith, you tend to get behind some of your guests and you become their biggest champions, which gets me really engaged with the guest. I think you're saying the same thing. No question. I mean, that, that really is the secret sauce. And I think the great ones learned that early on. And I think Stern would even tell you that probably his early shows, he talked too much. Yes. Right. Yes. And, uh, the, the one thing I love about Stern is he listens, he's engaged, but he'll hear something like you did DARPA. Yeah. And he'll, mm -hmm. and he'll dig down because he's, like I, we, we all love the rabbit holes. There's a meta area where you got to maintain on a program, but yeah. the rabbit holes are okay. And when you got a five or seven minute interview on a cable show or a radio show, that, there's no rabbit holes. You get, you got to be, you know, superficial. Yes. Yes. You know, and, and what I really love about podcasting, especially these live podcasting shows you, you can't afford to be superficial. You got to dig, you know, and that takes talent, man. That just, yes. Takes well, I listen, I, if I have a guest or not, I still show up and that takes talent to find something to say, to bring something to the audience, bring something of value. Right. So, but listen, I'm looking at the clock. Any great host always wants to make sure that their guest is never late for their next appointment. So, <laughs> I want to ensure I'm being respectful of your time. I know we booked for 75, so we have another 18 or so, uh, but I do want to be respectful of your time. Uh, are we? Able yeah, we're good. We're good? Okay, cool. Yeah, 18, yeah, 215. Is, um, is AM radio dead? Yes. You know, and I grew up on AM radio. Me I also grew too. up in a I loved AM radio, right? And, and, I also love that I was, I grew up in a two newspaper town, which is rare too, right? Right. Me too. Yeah. In yeah. Winnipeg, two newspapers. That's it. Yeah. Your AM, you had your AM paper and your PM paper. And, uh, and, uh, and my, my grandfather and I, who, you know, my grandfather was a big hero of mine. We would listen to WHIO in Dayton, which was news talk during the day and yeah. Yeah. Band music at night. I mean, it wasn't even contemporary. And I, I love those channels. And, when I started off uh, after undergrad, I was a software installer. Yes, I, I saw travel around the country in, in the, with a company car, and and the only really companionship you had was AM radio, and and uh, that was a lot mm. of sports talk, and you know the beginning of political mm. talk, mm. and um, you know I certainly miss those. If you listen to AM radio now, it is it, it it's vitriolic. It's very you know, angry, it's a mm -hmm. lot of re religious and mm -hmm. far could be far right, far left, as far as I'm concerned, because somehow they all come back to the same point, um, it, especially the United States. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but right now in the United States, they're, they're weaker signals. They're harder to find in newer cars. Right. Like, I have no idea how to get to an AM station in my in my in my new vehicle that we just bought. Well, our, and, te our Tesla doesn't even have AM radio in it. Doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right on. So it's a, it's a, it's unfortunately 
to me it's a it's a dead medium and you know fb fm just is clinging for life in the united states but all the more reason i think to go to to podcasting for these these legacy shows and a lot of the content like i said is you know it's a little rough and it's i don't know if it's beneficial to mankind ultimately <laughs> but but as a medium it's it's kind of sad to live through it because yeah, like we both noted, we, we lived, we lived it and it was exciting at one point in time. I wonder, so I'm going to, I'm going to take a stab of a contrarian view here. So I wonder if AM radio, Michael lives on through the same lens as fast is happening with television. You familiar with fast free advertising yeah. sort of channels right where yeah. you go buy yourself a tlc tv for 80 dollars and it's supported by advertisers and you get you know you get to all these channels that are actually already installed on the so i have a friend running a youtube channel who woke up one day go holy smoke there's an entire industry inside of the fast business he's getting his channels pre-installed on tvs so when yeah, tvs installed his content's already on it so i wonder oh, i wonder yeah i wonder if that same model precipitates itself in the future on the AM radio side, AM FM radio side, where a technology is thrown into cars because there's signals are out there anyways, right? There's signals out there. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering the question out loud. We struggled with AM early on. We had the opportunity to buy multiple AM radio channels ah. when, we, when we started the business because our, our, our founder and the family office that's funding us primarily are huge fans of AM radio. Uh, okay. They hold the same belief that we do. Like they grew up on it. We're all the same age, right? Yeah. So, okay. I'm drinking the same cooler then as you guys. Okay. I get it. Yeah. You did, you did so, some analysis and it wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't good. I mean, it, it was, it, honestly, a lot of it was like, are the, are the signals, are the towers, which is a big expense, are the towers themselves going to have to be replaced soon? And to be quite frank, most of the AM radio antennas, are operating at deficiencies. They just can't generate the same radio signal that they used to. So already, you know, you think, oh, it used to be a 50,000 watt. It's probably operating at 32,000, 28,000. It's not a 50,000 watt signal. So already the infrastructure is, is against you in that expense to build out that infrastructure again. It's, it's, it's older legacy technologies that they, they cost money. As opposed to pulling it on to the internet, like internet radio is almost free. You can buy internet yes. radio software, nine bucks a month. Yes. You know, probably still have the same influence and reach than you could from an AM signal. So then, I think it's pirate radio, to be honest with you. I hate to say it, but some technologies, as much as we lament their passing, probably should pass. Let me ask this then. My last poignant question of our public question before I load your brain up with some private questions off the air. I'm a local Winnipeg guy. You're a local Cleveland guy. I look around myself. There's one last public AM big dog radio station that owns the morning radio talk show here in town. They go 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. Monday to Friday. They're, they're the big dog, the 50,000 blowtorch. Drive time. Rock and roll. Will I be starting a YouTube channel doing the exact same thing, waiting for their inevitable demise? I would. It's true, eh? Yeah. It's true, isn't it? Like that that that's the future of local media. And I, I figured you were gonna say that because I had a conversation with another local fellow about this exact same conversation because I've asked myself, I said to myself going, well, I do this show Monday to Monday live anyways. Why don't I just add four more hours and just do it locally here and start a local radio? Like I'm here anyways. I have, I, yeah. Like my studio, I got a pretty big freaking studio here. Like I, I got the infrastructure. Why don't I just do this part of it? I've asked myself that question. Yeah, every hour is a new show, right? You're going to have a new host or a new guest. You yeah. can bring in co-hosts. You could have musical hack. You can really be creative on how you do that. Yes, yes. But but what you're saying is that in your belief, the days of AM radio are numbered and that a daily quote-unquote morning show in a local market, and especially here in Canada, as with Meta doesn't allow Canadian news here and Google because they have, I don't know if you know, but there's fucking, you can't. So Meta can't Meta doesn't share their news in Canada because of the government, right? There's a whole that's a whole other show. So local, you can't if you're in Winnipeg, you can't get local news on Facebook or Instagram. 
it's almost impossible to get local news here too. I mean, yeah, outside yeah. So, the same TV, kind of they, yeah. I mean, the newspapers are, you know, it, they're pamphlets. That's the, the biggest concern I have in the media industry uh, is the fourth estate is like independent media because Substack. It's being, yeah, it's being sub right. It's going to Substack or these smaller newsletters where your newsroom is three yes. people. Yeah, yeah. But That's but, but is that the case though? Because like yourself and myself, you probably followed certain writers and certain journalists you liked growing up. Well, I know absolutely. why. Yeah, right? absolutely. It wasn't about the publication they worked at. It was a fact that I liked Kevin Maney. Kevin Maney worked, worked for the New York Times, but he worked at, so I follow where Kevin Maney writes, right? Probably like yourself. So if Kevin Maney is going to go say, I'm going to start a Substack, pay me eight bucks a month. Okay, great. I'll go do that. I think that's a big part of the future, Michael. Yeah, the difference between a Substack and a newspaper is that, you know, occasionally you would glance at the other sections of the newspaper and yes. information where it's very myopic. You're getting one yeah. voice at the same cost. Look, I get it. You know, we, we've talked too about should we go buy the local, not the newspaper, but the brand. Should we go buy the local newspaper brand? Here it's the plain dealer. I would love to buy the plain dealer. Right. And we would figure out how we would want to do smart news. Now, our investor, interestingly enough, huge news fan like I am. We may come from it at different points. She may take a more Fox News approach, or I'm taking a more MSNBC approach. Sure. Yeah. But we both agreed that news needs to be one correct it needs to be factual and it needs to be disciplined to not be of one side or the other it's just the facts ma'am right you know, just the facts that's what i agree and that that there's a big market for just factual news like you talk local we ended up investing in five minute news uh so you can you can find five minute on evergreen.com or five minute.news and it's a daily news show, three stories, five minutes of fact. And that's it. We're, it's nice. not call, Now, we, we've spun off other shows off of that. One's called Unexplained. So it'll be a news story. Why is why did this thing happen? Why did this occur? So you're going to get a little bit more commentary, maybe a bit more opinion in that. But the underlying thing that we really ex was excited about was it's just news. It, it, you're going to get your facts. And if you want an opinion and commentary, you can go somewhere else if you, to get that. I I think there's a big marketplace in the future of taking the old AM radio news function and the daily newspaper news function and putting into a podcast or a local show like what you're thinking or a regional show like what you're thinking about to spread that. There's big opportunity there. And yeah. I don't think people have figured out that model yet. Michael De Aloya, I have had an awesome time with you here for 68 minutes or whatever it's been. I uh, would love to have you back again and talk more podcast. Just talk culture. I think we probably could talk music. We probably could talk news. <laughs> I'm we in on that conversation, right? I, I can tell. I can absolutely tell. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So uh, we'd love to have you back. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that the audience needs to be aware of from Evergreen, from Michael De Aloya, that we want to get on the table before we say goodbye? Listen, we never come with an ass, but I would say this, that if anyone in your audience, you family, friends, really want to talk offline about podcasting, we've got a whole team here, and that's all we do every day. Awesome. So we just we just love talking about ideas and concepts and thoughts and getting those down on paper. And, and if we can help, great. But if we're just a resource, that's okay too, man. We just want to spread the gospel. Awesome. Michael, thanks for joining me here today. I'm going to uh, put you back in the green room. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and come back and walk you out. Work for you? Keith, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and get some more makeup on. Awesome, man. Thanks for joining me today. I got it, brother. Be good. Hang tight. I'm going to do that. We're going to do this. And I'm going to put some tunes on if, if they want to come on. Uh, oh, yeah, there's... I, I guess I got to get the mute off. And I think I'll put the right camera on. There we go. Hey! Okay, so uh, awesome conversation we just had with Michael Delaware. If you are into the podcasting industry and you're tuning in late here and you came in late into the show, go back and listen to the whole thing. You will learn a lot. Get into the space. It's still relatively young when you think about it, 
right? A lot of opportunity there. Go back, listen to, go check out Evergreen Podcasts. Uh, Michael's got a five minute show for news, only news, no, no opinion stuff. Go check out all that stuff. Go connect with Michael on LinkedIn and come find me as well on LinkedIn. Most importantly, come find us. The Business Athlete Performance Lab. Come find Live in the Lab with Keith Billis, Monday to Monday, noon central time on LinkedIn, on X, and on YouTube. And come subscribe, inside.bapple.ai, B-A-P-L.ai. And most importantly, I've been reminded, if you like the show, get onto Apple Podcasts and go leave a review. It will really be helpful for us. Apparently, my kid's like, Dad, you got to get reviews, man. People want to see reviews. I'm like, all right, we're going to get reviews. I'm going to ask some reviews. So give us some reviews if you got some time. And we'll see you tomorrow here in the lab at noon central time. I'm out of here.